everyone could please take their seats. We're going to get started in just a moment. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the grand opening of the Union Square branch of the Green Line Extension. My name is Steve Poptak. I'm the general manager of the MBTA, and on behalf of the 6,400 men and women who are my colleagues here at the T, I'd like to welcome you all to this historic moment for the MBTA, for our current and future Green Line riders, and for the communities we serve. I'd like to ask everyone to please rise, and I'd like to introduce Dita Drummond. She is a sophomore from Cambridge Ridge in Latin who will sing the national anthem for us. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so boldly we held at the twilight? leadership and support of GLX as we brought this project to fruition. I want to thank all the dignitaries joining us here today for their advocacy, for their support of GLX, and their continued support of the MBTA. I want to thank current mascot secretary Jamie Tesler, former mascot secretary, now Federal Highway De Deputy Administrator Stephanie Pollack, and FMCB Chair Joe Aiello, as well as my other colleagues I serve with on the FMCB, for their leadership and guidance as we reconsidered GLX and got the project done. I want to thank our current... Absolutely. Board Chair Betsy Taylor and the MBTA's Board of Directors for their continued leadership. I want to give credit and thanks to GLX Program Manager John Dalton and the entire Green Line Extension team. Who revived this project, kept it on track, and got it done. Next, I want to thank, and I know we've got a huge number of people, most of them in yellow jackets here, from the MBTA's design-build partner, GLX Constructors. Thank you, sir. GLX Constructors, led by project manager Stephen Barnell, who really been instrumental in achieving this milestone. We look forward to continuing the collaborative efforts with GLXC as we work together to commence revenue service on the Medford branch. Particularly want to thank... want to thank our friends at the Federal Transit Authority 
for their hard work, their contributions. I want to express my thanks to Administrator Fernandez for joining us today, as well as Regional Administrator Pete Butler and his predecessor, Mary Beth Mello. Thank you all for this critical support. Finally, or not finally, second to last, I want to thank our federal delegation, our state legislators, our city representatives, all of our stakeholders, and our community advocates for helping us to push this project over the finish line. Thank you. Most importantly, I want to offer my thanks to the riders of the MBTA and the communities that we serve for their patience as we did so much work caused so much disruption in your communities. We're finishing up. It's going to be done. It's going to be great. Thank you for your patience. Now, when we did the groundbreaking several years ago, someone on this stage, who I will not name, said that this was the fifth or sixth GLX groundbreaking that they had participated in. <laughs> So I'm excited to actually welcome you to the opening of the Union Square branch. This really represents, and I know so many of you have played such critical roles in this, this represents the, cum the, the culmination of years of really difficult work, both on the policy side, on the funding side, and on the construction side. And now what do we end up with? We end up with a brand new station here in Lechmere, replacing what you see across the street, which was over 100 years old. It's fully accessible. It's going to be able to house the next generation of Green Line cars. We've got bike storage for 250 bicycles. And it's got a new and expanded busway that connects with the station. We also want to thank Divco, the developers of the Cambridge Crossing development that is just adjacent here, particularly Mark Johnson from Divco, who's also joining us here today. Beyond Leachmere Station, you also have Union Square Station, a completely brand new station serving one of Somerville's busiest neighborhoods. And again, it's got the same thing. It's accessible. It, can, it will be able to house the new Green Line cars. It's got bicycle storage areas. And for me, as a, as a Bostonian, the notion that I can travel from Heath Street and Jamaica Plain all the way to Union Square is mind-boggling. It's a wonderful new development for the T. So we are excited to open this up today. We want to invite you all back later this year when we open the Medford branch of GLX. The hard work that went into seeing this project through and completing the Green Line extension would not have been possible without the support of the baker Polito administration. And I'd like to now invite Governor Baker to say a few words. Governor. So thank you, Steve, and I am going to say a very few words, because there are 87 people on the speaking program today. Just one more example that success has a lot of friends and failure has none. Um, I do want to mention a couple of people in particular, because I think it's important, given how long this thing went on, that a lot of the folks who are involved in making sure that this thing eventually happened sort of get lost in the, in the wake. And one of them is the person who actually said, when we had the groundbreaking several years ago, that it was the fourth groundbreaking they'd been to. And the only reason they believed this one was real was because the feds came with $250 million for the project. That 250 was a down payment on the $1 billion that he wrestled out of the federal government for this project. And that's former Congressman Mike Capuano. And the, the other folks I want to thank, and believe me, I, I have a long list of people I would thank, but I don't want to leave you all standing here all morning. The, the one other group I really want to thank are the people who were involved, and you know who you were, in the process of trying to redesign this project to the point where we could get the feds to give us the billion dollars 
that uh, Congressman Capuano had wrestled out of the appropriation process. And those are the folks who basically took what was a $3 billion project and growing and got it down to a $2.3 billion project, which was then affordable and believable and fundable by the federal government. And that process took about six months. Um, their hair was pretty much on fire from the beginning of it to the end. Um, the work that was eventually done on this project meant that the money was give, not, a, not necessary and given back to the cities of Somerville and Cambridge. Somebody tell me the last time that happened. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I just have to say, and, and, and then Mayor Joe Curtitone said it at the time, that this was a project that the people of the neighborhoods of Somerville deserved. And I'm thrilled that we were able to deliver it for him. And I look forward to doing the Medford piece as well. Thank you. As I mentioned, the support for this project was really one critical element was the support of the Baker Polito administration. So I do want to invite Lieutenant Governor Polito to say a few words. Good morning, everyone. It's just about the noon hour. I, I come here to just say a few things, like the governor. Complicated should never, ever get in the way of completing something so important and so impactful. And in this case, something became complicated because it kept growing with a lot of input and a lot of probably good ideas from a lot of people. And it took a team of people, small group, to assess that and then work together to rescope, reorganize, reprioritize this project to literally get it back on track and make sure that this day would come to be a reality. I want to thank some of the early players that understood that. Uh, certainly, Congressman Capuano, a uh, mayor through to congressman, understood the meaning of this project. I want to thank. Mayor Curtitone, for your ability to work with the community stakeholders on all sides, having different issues to bring to it, but really focusing on getting this task done. And I want to thank our then Secretary, Stephanie Pollack, being as innovative and creative as she is to literally pull everyone together, help us get this project to a place that would meet its objectives and also meet the goal of the completion uh, of this project. It's great to have you here in your current role as well. And then, of course, to take... And, and then it takes a, a, a leader of the band to literally say, okay, Let's strike up the cord, and that, of course, is Governor Baker, who made this a priority and said we got to get this done. So to all of you, thank you, not only for the Commonwealth, but for the communities who will benefit, and mostly for the commuters and residents who will have access to a whole lot more opportunity because of the ability to get the job done. Congratulations to all of you today. As I mentioned in my remarks, the partnership to get this done was a critical element, and one element of that partnership was with our federal delegation. So with that, I'd like to invite Senator Elizabeth Warren to say a few words. This is a great day. Uh, I am so glad to be here to celebrate with all of you. You know, success has many mothers. And that is especially true for a big project like this. Uh, when I first learned about the Green Line, it was because it was already something that Mayor Curtitone and particularly Mike Capuano had worked on and pushed for. I was a candidate for Senate in 2012 when Mike Ca Capuano said to me, someone's going to have to push this and take the lead in the Senate. And that's what I started doing in 2013. It was both Mike Capuano, and I also want to give big thanks to Governor De Deval Patrick, who was a big part of pushing this forward. Without their work, we wouldn't be here today. And it was that first $100 million, sounds like a lot of money, not nearly enough, but enough to get this project started and make it real that began then. But 
even after we got the first hundred million dollars allocated for this project back in 2015, to go from a plan to a real operating T-line took so many more partners, including my special partner, Ed Markey, both first in the House and then in the Senate, who worked so hard on this project. And my Congresswoman, and I mean that literally, I vote for her every two years, Catherine Clark, who has worked so hard on this project, conspirator in all good projects, Ayanna Presley, Congresswoman Presley. And it is true, so many others at the state, at the local, at the federal level. But I also want to give a special shout out today to community activists and the transit and environmental leaders for your tireless advocacy over the years. Together, we demonstrated that partnership and persistence pay off. Our economy turns on infrastructure. Employees rely on infrastructure to get to work. Businesses rely on infrastructure to operate, to get access to employees and customers. Infrastructure means a future. Infrastructure means good jobs, good union jobs. responsibility to repair and maintain systems like the T, but it is also our duty to expand infrastructure, to underserve communities, because infrastructure is also about justice. The city of Somerville is the most densely populated city in New England, but until today, most of its residents have had no access to rail transit. Before today, mass transit in Somerville meant taking a diesel bus, a bus that dumps huge amounts of pollution into the air and soil of our neighborhoods. The same filth that causes climate change around the globe also creates serious public health problems locally, problems that hit disproportionately in black and brown communities. Fixed rail is fast and reliable, and it dramatically cuts down on pollution. And when it is done right, infrastructure projects like this let us tackle environmental justice head on. Transit, <laughs> transit is about more than getting from point A to point B. Transit is housing and housing is transit. A more fully developed T will give us more people, give more people access to housing and build economic opportunity across our communities. Our investment at the federal level needs to be in affordable housing and transit to be able to serve that housing. This is a great celebration today, but we need more celebrations in the future. A few months ago, Congress passed the infrastructure bill, and now $9 billion is headed to our Commonwealth. This money will let us build roads and bridges. It will permit us to replace diesel buses with electric buses. But it also gives us the chance, the chance, to build more fixed rail projects like this one. Transit projects like the T, East-West Rail, and new commuter lines all require vision and extraordinary persistence. And yes, it is important to repair potholes and crumbling overpasses, but we also need to be bold and visionary. We need to be willing to tackle big problems with big solutions. Our, our Commonwealth is about to receive once-in-a-generation federal funding. If we build a stronger future, 
We need to use a portion of that money to right past injustices and to prioritize communities that have been shortchanged. I want us to celebrate today, but I want us to begin today the hard work and the planning so that we can celebrate again and again and again as we build out our transit, build out our affordable housing, and build a future for everyone in this Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And now I'd like to invite Senator Markey to give us a few remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to uh, everyone who has worked so hard on this project. I'm just going to go down right now the list of people who are going to be uh, up here and on it, but they're all out there as well. The workers, the union workers who uh, helped to build this facility into this magnificent magnificent gift to the people of Massachusetts. Steve Poftak to uh, Governor Baker, uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito, to my partner in the United States Senate, uh, Elizabeth Warren. Thank you, Elizabeth, for everything you do every single day on the floor of the United States Senate for the people of Massachusetts and our country. Uh, to Congresswoman Clark and Ayanna Presley, thank you for what you do being a voice for uh, the people. To uh, Maria Fernandez, our FTA administrator, thank you so much for being here. To uh, Jamie Tesler, the Transportation Secretary. To uh, Stephanie Pollack, who has been here since uh, the beginning. Um, Pat Jalen, Mayor uh, Katiana Ballantyne. Um, <laughs> Mayor Sumbul Siddiqui. Uh, Project Manager John Dalton and and we want to go back to the beginning of time and it turns out that the first formal proposal for an MBTA extension from Leachmere Station was in 1926. Mm -hmm. 1926. And I now am going to uh, mention someone who had a vision, but as we know, a vision without funding is an hallucination. So Mike Capuano, thank you for having the vision and the funding to make sure that we would have this project. And Mayor Curtitoni, thank you for partnering historically with uh, with Mike, uh, right up to uh, uh, right up to uh, May Valentine today uh, to finish this project. Uh, we're in Cambridge. Boston is right there. The red brick building is Somerville. So this is regional planning as well. This is an incredible vision for what can happen in the future. But of course. Um, we have to make sure that we do development without displacement. Yeah. This is also something that has to be done in conjunction with housing policy, equity policies that think of everyone who lives in each of these communities. Uh, and we also have to think in terms of now that we have this new rapid transit, we also have to think in terms of fair free transit to make sure that it is equitable. That it is equitable for everyone. Because today, for the first time, thousands of Cambridge and some of the residents can board Green Line trains and travel to Boston and the rest of the MBTA network, enabling them to take advantage of new economic opportunities while promoting safer and cleaner modes of transportation. The green in the green line is a money line. This station will connect workers to jobs, to businesses, and communities to the larger regional economy. And it will also 
significantly reduce vehicle trips and fossil fuel emissions, which benefits the environment while relieving traffic congestion and providing new transportation options in historically underserved areas. Public transit projects like the Green Line extension are critical for the Green New Deal to become a reality in Eastern Massachusetts and all across the Commonwealth. And the opening of Union Station is only the beginning. Five more stations will open soon, linking thousands of residents in Medford and Somerville and Cambridge to downtown Boston. Uh, we have a vision uh, that is going to transform the way in which people travel. By 2030, 50,000 passengers are going to be expected to use these new stations delivering enormous economic, environmental, and community benefits to the region. I know how important this project is to the residents of Somerville, Medford, and Cambridge, and our surrounding communities. That is why I have fought so hard to deliver money from the, from the federal government, partnering with Elizabeth Warren and Congresswoman Clark and Presley. And we worked hard to secure nearly $1 billion in federal funding to support the Green Line extension, and we're going to continue to fight to secure additional federal dollars from the $9 billion uh, which was passed as part of the bipartisan infrastructure package last year. This transformative package contains key funding and policies that can modernize the country's fiscal infrastructure for the 21st century across the Commonwealth and the country. The infrastructure law will enhance safety, promote equity, increase funding for passenger rail, public transit, bridges, roads, clean water, and broadband. The package also contains important down payments to help correct the historic injustices committed against low-income neighborhoods and communities of color when we first built our highway and transit systems in this country. In total, Massachusetts will receive more than $9 billion from this law over the next five years, and with every infrastructure investment, we have an opportunity to create good-paying jobs, spur economic growth across Massachusetts. This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to make our cities and towns greener, cleaner, and more equitable. As that infrastructure money begins to flow into our Commonwealth, the Green Line extension serves as a shining example of the type of infrastructure improvement we must make in the 21st century. I want to thank, once again, everyone who played a role. Uh, and we have not finished this until you can go from Tufts University, Madam Mayor Brianna, all the way to downtown Boston. That is a vision worth fighting for, worth funding. Thank you all so much, all of you, for everything you Thank you, Senator. I'd now like to invite Congresswoman Presley to join us. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Ballantyne, uh, Mayor Curtatoni, it's wonderful to uh, be with you. Congratulations. I was uh, sitting there reflecting on the conversations I've had with you both about the need to abolish the filibuster in the Senate, uh, but today we're not abolishing the filibuster, uh, which is why <laughs> we're all taking our time up here today. Uh, but, 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 be <laughs> yeah. uh, but before I get into uh, some brief remarks, um, I just want to say how unfortunate it is that it took a pandemic for people to understand uh, and appreciate the value of our essential workers. Uh, and I just want to say thank you for all. Did you contribute? Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, just, it's wonderful to be here to celebrate with all of you today the opening of Union Square Station and the continued Green Line Extension project. It is wonderful to share this day, as well with so many vigilant, passionate,
passionate transit champions who have played a part in making this moment happen and bringing us all together. And I know we're all thrilled to see the station open and already operating as of this morning uh, to serve the residents, the visitors, and the workers of Somerville and the Commonwealth. Now, I want to thank each person gathered here today for their notable contributions. Um, this is the part where uh, my team uh, slips me a note and says, don't start naming people because you will leave someone out. Um, so I'm not going to name everyone, but I do want to take a moment to commend and to thank my predecessor for his vigilance, his leadership, and his commitment. Uh, when I first joined the stage, I gave him uh, the green ribbon from the ribbon, cutting, the ribbon cutting. Uh, and I thought that appropriate uh, because uh, in many ways we are the beneficiaries of his leadership all those many years ago, which made today possible. So Congressman uh, Mike Capuano, thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. Today is a celebration. It's an opportunity to look forward and to consider all the benefits that this portion of the project will provide. The economic growth that we are seeing in Somerville will only be enhanced by public transit that is going to connect folks to jobs, to food, to health care, and other critical resources. Now, I grew up uh, raised in a single parent household. I relied on public transportation throughout my life. I know firsthand just how game changing it is to have these options available to you and how challenging it is for folks to get by without it. In the Massachusetts 7th and throughout our Commonwealth, transit justice is an issue of consequence for our families. Access medical care, getting to work on time, picking your kids up from school, reliable transit isn't a nice to have, it is a must have. But I'd also just like to say this because many of us will center what this means in terms of connectivity to all the things that I just highlighted. But again, as someone who's relied on public transit for most of my life, can I just say that it's not enough to call a place home. That in order for you to make a life, to build community, it has everything to do with, with connectivity. And so this is also about connecting to neighbors, uh, breaking down uh, barriers, building community, connection to arts and culture, to the real verve and life of a city. And that matters too. And that's also what this makes possible. And then, as we've so often uh, spoken to today, transit is intersectional to everything else. It is a matter of economic justice. It is a matter of climate and environmental justice. And it is a matter of housing justice. And we cannot divorce these two from one another. And in my role in the financial services a committee and its co-founder, of the, uh, the caucus, the Future of Transportation Caucus, which is really just fighting the need for federal funds to make sure that we are investing in transportation as the public good that it is, that we are centering equity, accessibility, connectivity, and sustainability. But in that role and in my role in the Financial Services Committee, I will make sure that we do not sacrifice housing justice, which is a human right, in the name of transit justice. And as Senator Markey uh, spoke to in just uh, providing that contextual history here, for, year trans for many years, transportation systems in the Commonwealth and across our country have perpetuated disparities, forcing many of our low-income neighbors to pay more, to endure long commutes, to lose out on pay and family time. Access to safe, reliable, and inclusive modes of transportation are a matter of social justice. Now, just last week, the U.S. Census Bureau released data showing that folks in Massachusetts have the fourth longest commute times in the country and the third highest use of public transportation. So the Green Line Extension Project will support 50,000 passenger trips per day once completed. So the need is here. 
And we need to continue expanding these transit, transit options that our neighbors have been calling on that will improve their lives and the benefit of our communities at the same time. Again, congratulations to everyone when this project is fully completed. Residents of Somerville and Medford will be able to get across their neighborhoods and Boston to jobs, family, and entertainment with no or minimal transfers and shorter wait times. It is my hope that this is not an end, but it is a beginning and a step to a more fully connected region and a commonwealth where we all have the freedom to get to where we need to go. Congratulations, truly a great day. Thank you, Congresswoman. The partnership I talked about at the federal level includes not just our legislative partners, but also in the executive branch. This project was budgeted at $2.3 billion. It benefited from a billion dollars from the FTA, which I think is worth a round of applause. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Federal Transit Administration Administrator Nuria Fernandez to say a few words. Good afternoon, MBTA. <laughs> I am so delighted to be here with you all as you celebrate um, what has been, from what I'm hearing, a very long-awaited happening. <laughs> I want to thank uh, General Manager Steve Poftek. Thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, on behalf of Secretary Pete Buttigieg and the Biden-Harris administration, I can't tell you how excited not only I am, but everyone is in Washington at the Federal Transit Administration to have been not only a partner with you throughout all the years, but to be able to have me stand here with you to celebrate uh, right here in Cambridge as you cut the ribbon for the Green Line extension. Yes, green is for money, but also it's for climate because for every vehicle off the road and people in public transit, you'll be able to enjoy many, many more days of blue skies. A, a very special thanks uh, to Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Senator Markey, and Senator Warren. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman uh, Presley and Congresswoman Clark. Because of our members in Congress, we are able to do this and we want to do more. Thank you, because without you, it's difficult to get the funding. We need advocates, and we need to continue pushing for more funding. I also want to, uh, talking about, speaking about uh, advocates for transit, uh, Mayor Ballantyne, Mayor Siddiqui, uh, everyone who has contributed. I want to uh, pay special tribute to uh, State Senator Pat Yellen and former elected officials like uh, Mayor Curtoni and uh, Congressman Capuano, who have been mentioned many times here today. You made it possible for us to be here. Also, of course, to the MBTA staff, uh, John Dalton, Bolton, and uh, the leadership, all the, the construction workers, the engineers that made uh, this project possible. And I also want to make special mention to my colleague, uh, Stephanie uh, Pollack. Stephanie was here as Secretary of Transportation. She did burn the midnight oil, negotiating to the finest details so that this project could happen. Because all of you who've been following this for years know that it really did take a village to get us here. And that village will continue relying on Secretary Tesla for his leadership as you move forward. Uh, there's so many more names uh, that I could be uh, calling on, but you know who you are. And you know how important public transportation is. It is really that lifeline. It is that backbone. It connects communities. It provides access to jobs and opportunities and health care and education. It levels the playing field. It's an equalizer. And that's what we are believers in is to making sure that everyone can enjoy and celebrate in these types of infrastructure investments. Uh, Steve, you and your MBTA team did a yeoman's work uh, to complete this project in the midst of a pandemic and supply ch challenges. So congratulations to all of you on a job well done.
And last in the acknowledgments, but never least, my amazing FTA Region 1 team, Pete Butler and our Deputy Administrator, Michelle Mullinger, who are here and their team for their excellent work in leading the federal transit programs in the Northeast. So we're here to celebrate the opening of the first branch of the Green Line Extension, and it's already transforming this region, creating so many opportunities for the residents. I am so proud uh, for the role that the Federal Transit Administration has played on this project, because we talk about dreams, but there's nothing sweeter than the reality of it happening. Not only providing the billion dollars uh, through our capital investment programs and uh, certainly through uh, other federal agency funding at, FTA, at DOT, but we also provide technical assistance throughout the process through the planning, the development, the construction, and now the opening. The MBTA and its partners succeeded. That it succeeded is a testament to, that so many people, uh, from the governors all the way to those who are all clapping here today, have been essential to making this possible. What this line will mean to communities is very obvious. You see the development happening. You see the excitement about people being able to walk and get on a system that can get them to where they want to go quickly. This area is seeing the economic benefits uh, that spin off from a well-conceived, well-designed transit projects. But we want to make sure that those benefits are inclusive and that everyone gets to enjoy and be able to participate in those benefits. Transit is a catalyst, a, a catalyst that connects people. So just down the line uh, near the new Union Square station, the construction is on the way for a million square foot uh, lab and residential properties with three times more development that's happening. This is remarkable. It's remarkable because in an era of pandemic when we're all wondering, is the economy going to bounce back? All you have to do is stand here, stand there, and look around. And it is coming back. But, I, but it really takes all of you to continue to help the economy grow, to continue to be part of projects and support projects like this. The bipartisan infrastructure law is providing over $100 billion for public transportation over five years. There's going to be opportunities for many, many more projects throughout this community. I want to just uh, take this time to also recognize that even though I heard the 1928, which makes it almost a century since you all were dreaming about this, there's nothing wrong to dream. But what we have to do is come together in partnership to make these things happen, because there's no better time than now. Congratulations. Thank you, Administrator. The T functions within a broader transportation system and a broader transportation context in Massachusetts, and we work very closely with our partners in MassDOT who have been uh, amazing in terms of their support, not only of this project, but all of the construction projects we undertake. So I'd like to invite MassDOT Secretary Jamie Tesler to speak. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it's wonderful to be here today, and I'm going to uh, just briefly uh, add a few words to many th the, the many things that have already been said, uh, and the many people have been thanked. But I want to begin by thanking uh, the entire MBTA team, many of whom are here, um, who have done the hard work to deliver this today, and our partners on the design build team who have done the hard work uh, and are doing the hard work to finish this job in construction. Um, and I want to thank the GLX team in particular, uh, and, our, and our team leader, John Dalton, for the work you've done uh, day to day to deliver this project. I also want to thank our team at MassDOT who has been alongside this project and this work from the very beginning. For, for me, after so many years in transportation, I look around and see so many people who have had so much to do with this project, and it does take that much to deliver a project of this scale and this importance. And it's impossible to touch on uh, and thank so many people. 
Um, but I want to take a moment to uh, amplify some remarks that were said earlier about a particular moment in time. Uh, a few years ago when this project faced real challenges in costs. And at that time, uh, Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor, Sec former Secretary Pollack, now Deputy Administrator, uh, led us to rethink, reimagine, uh, and to rejuvenate this project so we could be here today. And I want to thank them for their leadership at that difficult moment and all that we learned as part of that team. I also want to thank the FMCB who led us uh, through that process, uh, Chairman Aiello, uh, Vice Chair Tibbetts Nutt, uh, Brian Lang, and the other members of the FMCB, uh, Steve Poftak who was on the F FMCB at that time. So thank you for your help at that time to help this project get back on track. At that time, we, we got to work, shaved several hundred million dollars off the cost of the initial plan, plans for this project. We worked together collaborating with our municipal leaders uh, in Somerville and Cambridge and community residents to get this project going and to get, work at build it, to, get to work at building it. And there's a lot, a lot of excitement today, and there should be. And this certainly is a shining example of what the MBTA can do. We have come a long way in planning, designing, building, and completing core infrastructure work since that time in 2016. And after a record-breaking year of $1.92 billion that we spent last fiscal year, the MBTA expects to exceed $2 billion in capital spending this current fiscal year. The T's capital investment each year has grown in leaps and bounds. Just to make the point, and by way of example, in 2014, the MBTA's capital investment was only $600 million. The T is evolving every single day, and as part of its $8 billion five-year capital investment program, we are renovating stations, modernizing fare collection systems, and upgrading services for our buses, subways, and ferries, and improving the accessibility of the entire system. So as we celebrate today's important milestone. I can state that the best still lies ahead based upon the work we're doing to improve the core infrastructure in Massachusetts. Thank you again. It's been great to be here today. So continuing with the theme of secretaries, it is my great pleasure to introduce former MassDOT secretary, current Federal Highway Deputy Administrator, and dedicated Green Line rider, Stephanie Pollock. So I'm delighted to be here today with so many elected officials and others who have been part of the story of turning the promise of the Green Line extension into a reality. I have a feeling that the reason I am here in this amazing company is less about my current role at Federal Highway and more about my past relationship to the project. Like many of the people who are both behind me and in front of me, I've been waiting for and working toward this day not just for years but for decades. Uh, as most everyone here today knows, back in 2006 I was working at the Conservation Law Foundation and we reached an agreement with what was then the AACLF. Uh, with what was then the um, Executive Office of Transportation and Construction, both to enable and mitigate the Central Artery Tunnel Project, or Big Dig. That agreement required a suite of transit commitments, including the extension of the Green Line, which was to be completed by December of 2014. While that did not happen, December of 2014 did mark a critical milestone for the project with the signing of a full funding grant agreement, between the Federal Transit Administration and then Governor Deval Patrick. So when I became Secretary of what by then had turned into MassDOT in early 2015, I assumed we all assumed the project was finally truly back on track. Unfortunately, as comedian Will Rogers once said, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. The getting run over part began the day that 
that the late and lamented Frank DePaula came in and told me that the contractor's guaranteed maximum price for the project had come in nowhere near what had been expected and that our $2 billion project was looking like a $3 billion plus project. What happened next, what Governor Baker rightly referred to as the hair on fire period, um, is only one chapter in the long and complicated history of the Green Line Extension, but it's important to talk about today because it is a tale of what happens when all levels of government and the broader community are committed to make something happen and find a way to work together even when they can't agree on everything. As always, I'll start with Governor Baker. The easiest thing to do in 2015 would have been to give up and walk away from another mega project with cost overruns, a looming Big Dig 2.0. But from the start, the governor and his team understood that what the Green Line extension meant, not just as a transit project, but as a transformative development project and worked like hell to find a solution. Then there was our amazing Massachusetts congressional delegation working seamlessly together under the leadership of Senators Warren and Markey, Delegation Dean Richie Neal, and then Congressman Mike Capuano. Even members whose districts would not necessarily benefit from GLX understood that the only way the Commonwealth could secure and keep $1 billion in federal funding was to speak with one voice and work together, and they did just that. Next was our partners at the Federal Transit Administration, which could have written off GLX as a capital investment gone awry, but never did. The team at FTA here in Boston, then led by Mary Beth Mello, now by Pete Butler, along with Jane Williams, Matt Welbis, and Lucy Garilikas at headquarters were the best partners you could ask for. Together, we worked through the project risks and how to mitigate them. They were honest about what needed to change at the T for the federal dollars to flow, and the T was responsive about making the very wise changes that FTA demanded. And I think everyone knows how our local partners in both Cambridge and Somerville stepped up, not just with advocacy and support, but with the flexibility to live with changes in the project, which were politically difficult to embrace, but essential to bringing the price down to something the Commonwealth could afford. Then Somerville Mayor Joe Curtitone, and then Cambridge City Manager Richard Rossi even put precious local dollars on the table to demonstrate their commitment to the project. I also can't leave out the advocacy and community and transit and environmental groups who never let those of us in government forget what this project was about and what we owed to the people of Cambridge and Somerville who had waited so long for the transit that they needed and the economic development it would bring. I have to be honest. It's easier to be on the outside as an advocate than on the inside being held accountable. But our civic system would not do its job half so well without persistent and effective advocacy by the community. So thank you. For me, however, the unsung heroes of the GLX saga will always be the men and women at the MBTA and MassDOT who time and again ran into obstacles but persisted until they found workable solutions. A special shout out goes to MBTA Fiscal and Management Control Board Chair Joe Aiello and MassDOT Board Vice Chair Ruth Bonsignor who spent countless volunteer hours providing priceless advice and encouragement to the joint MassDOT MBTA team. And another shout out to now Secretary Jamie Tesler and lawyer extraordinaire Marie Breen, who steered us through the shoals of unwinding the unworkable procurement that had produced the $3 billion cost and put in place the procurement that found the joint venture that delivered the project that we celebrate today. Finally, I reserve my strongest accolades and greatest admiration for the super project manager without whom none of us would be standing here today, John Dalton. imagine what would have happened if we hadn't been able to talk John into moving his family here and taking on the then sideways project that needed him to straighten it out. When I think about how our administration can help deliver on the many mega projects that will be funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law, my perspective is indelibly shaped by what I learned from watching John Dalton and his team make the Green Line extension a reality. Speaking of the bipartisan infrastructure law, I will close by noting that the Green Line extension demonstrates perfectly how investing in sustainable, equitable, multimodal infrastructure can transform not just the transportation system, but the communities the system serves. The real winner today, as the Green Line extension begins operations at long last, is not just infrastructure. 
The winners are the people whose lives will be improved, the communities whose futures will be transformed, and perhaps some restored belief in the power we all have to build a better future together. Thank you. It's my Thank you, Darren. It is now my pleasure to open up uh, another part of the program where we're going to have representatives from the various communities al along the Green Line address us. So I'd like to begin with Senator Pat Jalen. Senator? Well, I was asked to uh, speak today to represent the many state legislators who've worked toward this day. Our former representatives, Denise Provo, Carl Shortino, and Tim Toomey can't be here today, but I'd like my current colleagues to stand up. Senator Sal Domenico, Representative Christine Barber, Representative Mike Connolly, Representative Sean Garbley, and Representative Erica Eiderhoven. So we're celebrating today and I am speaking for all of us, not just the opening of the first Green Line stations, the first Green Line extension stations, but the decades of community activism that made it possible. The mothers that tried to stop block I-93. The neighbors who fought to stop the inner belt from coming through my neighborhood. The conservation law foundation. Uh, and Stephanie Pollock, who got a commitment to the Green Line extension as part of I-93 mitigation and then had to file again when it was threatened. The activists who filled Somerville High School Auditorium twice when the project was about to be canceled. The advocates who persisted with staff, maybe if you hear yourself called out, you would raise your hand. The advocates with step and the friends of the community path and Medford's Green Line Neighborhood Alliance and the Green Line Extension Working Group, as well as the elected officials and appointed people and all the workers who've been recognized today. There were many times in the past 30 years that this project seemed to be at a dead end. But the dedication and the persistence of so many people, most of them unnamed today, and many of them no longer with us, that got us over every roadblock. This is an important milestone, but our work is not done. Many people today think that the Green Line will per permanently end at Tufts West Medford, but we will not stop until it reaches Route 16. <laughs> So as we've noted, the Green Line extension was initially approved to offset air pollution from I-93. For 40 years, the people of the Mystic, along Mystic Ave and in East Somerville have suffered disease and death due to that pollution. How can we make up for those lost years? The Green Line extension is not enough. We need barriers to stop the pollution and the noise now. And as we celebrate the enormous, enormous economic growth unlocked by this project, we can't forget the people left behind and pushed out by the rapid rise in property values and rents. Apparently everybody in the United States wants to live along the Green Line extension. <laughs> but the things that make our community attractive won't exist if immigrants, working class people, long-term residents and artists, as well as small businesses and family-owned triple-deckers are gone. There are solutions we can and should adopt immediately as an emergency to stop displacement, protect existing affordable housing, and promote home ownership as well as to build new affordable housing for all ages and all family sizes.
It will be tragic if the people who need public transit the most can't afford to live near it. Thank you for the, to everyone who has contributed over the years to this achievement. Thanks also, I think they haven't been mentioned yet, to the taxpayers, without whose contributions this would not be possible. And without, thank you. And without their support, its maintenance and its operation won't be possible. So thanks to everyone who continues to the effort to expand public transit and the many other public benefits that make our lives uh, better. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator. I'd like to now in invite Somerville Mayor Kachana Ballantyne to join us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's just so wonderful to see everybody here. I would like to acknowledge some of my colleagues in government from Somerville here. I see Councillor Strezzo, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Beneda Newfeld, Wilson, Ewan Campen, and anybody else who's here, please raise your hand. Thank you. And I would really like um, so, uh, Somerville um, staff. Uh, the planning, the mobility division, the housing bill. Please raise your hands because I see you over there. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to my, uh, my predecessors, Congressman Capuano and former Mayor of Somerville and um, former Mayor Mike Cap uh, Curtis, excuse me, it's been a long one, it's called Joe Curtitonix. So as we celebrate the Green Line Extension Station opening today, it's important to be mindful of history and to bear in mind the Green Line Extension is only a partial remedy of the many decades of harm, of social and environmental injustices that our community has suffered as the result of post-war urban renewal. This station opening is one very positive step in the right direction, but we have a long ride ahead and there is much more work to do. The post-World War II urban renewal projects like the building of Interstate 93 through densely populated neighborhoods in Somerville and other communities caused massive displacement, created pollution that caused an epidemic of lead poisoning and other illnesses. Urban renewal planning was focused on expanding facilities for suburban commuters to drive through our urban neighborhoods while it took away all the trolley transit in Somerville at a time that employment centers in Somerville were failing. Communities were destroyed, workers and their families were displaced. They were made homeless and ill as they were losing their jobs. These injustices, of course, inspired activism from our residents who fought three decades and more for the station's opening. Groups like the Conservation Law Foundation, in Somerville, the Mystic View Task Force, and Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership laid the groundwork for change by inspiring us to work for mixed-use, transit-oriented planning and development that will help us to recreate a community with good local jobs, more affordable housing, better public transportation, and a cleaner and healthier environment. It inspired a vision of multimodal transit approach with our activist groups, Friends of the Community Path. To extend the community path along the Green Line extension for pedestrian and cyclists. All these activists organized 30 years of community work that made today happen. Over 20 years ago, I joined with those early activists working for the Green Line Extension and environmental justice 
because their clear vision and our shared desire for justice. That shared desire for justice was united many of us who stand here today. And this milestone demonstrates what we can accomplish when we work together. I want to recognize and thank our activists for their vision and great effort and others who helped us realize this progress. From STEP, Ellen Reisner, Wig Zaymor, Karen Malloy, Jim McGinnis, Christy Chase, Andrea Yokovic, Steve Mulder, Rachel Fishbound, Gabe Disler, Dan Fairchild, Steve Kaiser, Mystic View Task Force, Bill Sheldon, Barbara Steiner, Don Meglio, the Friends of the Community Path, Lynn Weissman, Joel Bennett, Alan Moore, Rachel Burkhart, Jonah Petrie. From Medford Green Line Neighborhood Alliance, Ken Krause, Elizabeth Bale, John Elliott, Doug Carr, Laura Ruma. From the Conservation Law Foundation, Doug Foy, Raphael Maris, Kerry Russell. From the East Cambridge Planning Team, Helen Hoffman, Alan Green, Mark Jacob and some of the local and regional advocate partners who deserve thanks. Todd Kaplan, Holly Pope, Heather Van Alst, Ann Tate, the Somerville Chamber of Commerce, Dan Grabowskis, Fred Salvucci, Jim Alioso, Rich Davey, Dave Moeller, Eric Barossa, Kate Fichter, Christine Kirby. You all matter. You made this happen. Thank you. This very important Green Line station represents one milestone in our effort to restore Somerville to a place where residents and their families can live with social, economic, environmental, and transit justice. There is still much more work to be done for better access to local jobs, for housing as a human right, for cleaner air and healthier environments. Today, we should celebrate our shared achievements, absolutely. We should renew our efforts to keep working for more transportation equity. We need complete safe streets, multimodal streets that work for everyone. We need to keep pushing to get the Green Line extension to Route 16. To keep pushing for the North-South connector, we need to invest in the Grand Junction Rail. We need to electrify everything. And we should keep pushing to make public transportation free. A, a, great, a great journey begins with a single step. And today, a new stop. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to invite Cambridge Mayor Sambol Siddiqui to join us. Thank you, Mayor. A little cold up here, so. <laughs> it's so wonderful to be here. I want to take a moment and acknowledge my colleagues on the City Council who are also here with us. Vice Mayor Alana Mallon, Councillor Carlone, Councillor Patty Nolan, Councillor Azeem, uh, Councillor E. Denise Simmons, it's great to have you here with me today. I want to thank everyone who spoke before me for their work on this project. We're so lucky in Cambridge to have elected leaders at the state and federal level who we know are working so hard for our community and prioritizing public transit. And of course, I also want to thank the Green Line Extension team and the many people who've been working hard for years to build this extension. Today I'm thinking about my dad, Inam Siddiqui who, had, since coming to this country, has never driven a car. So he takes a 69 bus and then jumps on the green line from Leechmere to go to work at a department store as a shipping clerk for 25 years. So he was so excited to have this reopen. So I'm thinking about him. I think about how this extension is an investment in the economic and environmental health of our communities. And this will help us be a more green and equitable region. The impacts of that cannot be overstated. Back in 2015 and 2016, when there were questions about the project moving forward, 
Cambridge, along with the city of Summerhill, you've heard, was asked to step up and provide unprecedented financial support for the extension to move forward. Over the following years, thanks to exceptional project management on behalf of the state, the project did not end up utilizing our funds, and we're pleased that the money we contributed has been returned to us and to Dicko West, who also committed funding. But we'll be ready whenever, if ever, there is a need to assist. Now that this project is complete, this extension will help support the ongoing development in East Cambridge and throughout Kendall Square. It will provide the residents of East Cambridge better transit options. As we continue to make strides in sustainable transportation in Cambridge, this project and our partners at the state and federal level will have a big impact on our sustainability goals. Finally, I want to take the opportunity to thank the many city staff from a wide range of departments who have helped on the planning of this project over the many decades. I want to thank Assistant City Manager Aaron Farouk, Director of Parking and Transportation Joe Barr, Director of Environmental and Transportation Planning Suzanne Rusmussen, and many others from Cambridge who helped get this project across the finish line. I know all of you are there, so please, I want to just give you all a round of applause. We're really lucky. And of course, I want to acknowledge our city manager, Louis A. Dipspali, and past city manager, Rich Rossi, for all their work. This was truly a great partnership between Cambridge and the state and the federal and the local governments, along with our partners in the private sector. And I'm so proud to join everyone here in celebrating the culmination of years of hard work. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak, and I'll see you on the Green Line. Take care. It's now my pleasure to introduce a name we've heard in uh, a couple sets of remarks today, but it's my pleasure to introduce former Congressman Mike Capuano. Thank you. I want to start by thanking the one group of people that hasn't yet been thanked, the people who installed the pigeon gods above your head. I've noticed a few places that still need to be done. <laughs> but for those of you that are old enough to remember the old Sullivan Square and what that did, um, I don't want this to become the next Sullivan Square. I also want to thank uh, my friend and colleague for forever, John Lenacek, who's standing in the back now working at MassDOT. And my other friend who's not here, Paul Train, and of course my wife, because without them I wouldn't have been here today. I, I'm kind of done with this stuff, and I was very nice, thank you very much, and I will tell you that they made me come because it's the right thing to do. And you've all heard how long this took. It's true. I've just turned 70 years old this year, and I will tell you that, well, that doesn't do it. <laughs> when I'm 90, you can clap. But I can tell you, I do not remember a day in my life when the people of Somerville didn't think the Green Line was coming soon. <laughs> and we're here. It didn't happen overnight. I remember tons of stories. But in my estimation, the thing that really happened was a conglomeration of political events. In 2006, Democrats took over the House in Congress. That put me in a position to encourage a few people to do some things that they didn't want to do. We also got lucky to get a governor who was elected who understood transit equity and wanted to help. But even then, as you heard, the full funding agreement, which really is the thing that kicks the whole thing off, didn't get signed until the last month of his term. That opened the door to the FTA. They married Beth and Pete and others, which is fantastic. They love building things, and they do a great job. But they can't do it without the state. The state had gotten us there. The people of Somerville and Cambridge and Medford had gotten us there. The state delegation it was fantastic. I can't tell you how much fun it was. The mayor was fantastic. The mayor of Cambridge was fantastic. But let's be honest, as soon as we get the full funding agreement, my long-term friend Charlie Baker got elected. 
There were a lot of people in Somerville who didn't vote for Charlie. A lot. <laughs> And you know what? And today, as a lifelong Democrat, I can sit here and you look me in the eye for the first time, publicly say that I did vote for Charlie Baker. <laughs> and I voted for him because I've known him for a long time. And there were a lot of people that thought, and I'll be honest with you, politically, those of you who know me, you know I am a political animal. I, I'm still recovering, but I still am. There is no political reason in the world that Charlie Baker should have kept this project online. It was all the budget. It was still tenuous. He knew that by doing this, it wouldn't get him very many votes. But I told you I've known him. Charlie Baker doesn't make decisions like that. His decisions are based on what he thinks is right and what he thinks is going to work. And instead of just walking away and taking, let's remember, yes, the federal government gave a billion dollars, and that's wonderful. So did the state. They gave a billion dollars. Politically, that state billion dollars probably would have paid back better dividends for Charlie Baker if he put it someplace else. And he didn't. He got to work with Stephanie and others, and they hired John Dalton, to make the project work. The FTA stood at the table every day and helped, and the pressure came. To me, that's political courage, that's political leadership. And it deserves to be recognized, because it is so easy to do the easy things. And so for me, I want to guess, Charlie's right, I, I did say I would never come to another groundbreaking. And the truth is, he never had another one, so it was okay. <laughs> and I'm glad I'm here today to say thank you to everybody who participated in this project. Because for me, this is not about... This is about the past, for me. All the people that got screwed, all the people that got kicked out of their houses from McGrath Highway, people forget that. 10,000 people lost their homes when they built McGrath Highway in the 50s. Another several thousand got kicked out on Route 93. Others lost their homes and their businesses from the inner belt. Most people don't even know what those empty runways off of 93 were going to go to. This is the first, or the second now, significant contribution and recognition by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that urban areas still matter. That equity still matters. And for me, it's been a long time coming. It's a very, very nice day to be here with a lot of people who did this to say thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Next, I'd like to invite Somerville, former Somerville Mayor Joe Curtitoni to join us. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Steve. Well, good afternoon. If I speak quickly, I do speak quick, but my teeth are chattering because I'm freezing over here. And I had to save John Dalton after all the risk of working the construction zone. He was almost done in by a, a palm. A um, couple of clarifications, Mike. Again, congratulations to 70. Steve Poftak said you qualify for a special rate on the ride. We can get you home. <laughs> Secondly, Governor, you got more than 5,000 votes in Samuel. That's more than Swampscott. So, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I've taken three rides today in the train, including the first ever from Union Square 450, for four, at 450, and I haven't paid a dime for a ride yet. So, but I figured you took that out of the 50 million. Today is an exciting day. I'm going to try not to repeat everything that's been said. Success, anything we accomplish is always the product of many hands. Senator Warren said, success has many parents. In fact, Mike Connolly reminded me this, and it's true. It, that is a fact. But when the times are tough, 
Those years of doubts and naysayers and broken promises, we were left as orphans. And let me be clear, and I'm going to thank a lot of people today, because everybody, our partners at the federal level, <coughs> state and local, had a role in this. The people of Somerville, organizations like STEP, Friends of the Path, the Chamber of Commerce, Union Square Main Streets, aligned with stakeholders in Medford and Cambridge, we are only here because they would not accept anything less than the Green Line, and they fought like hell for it for decades. <laughs> so time, time is no friend of construction projects, we know, certainly not politics or in life, but it's important we, we look back on time to give context. You heard a lot of it. I was an elected official for 26 years, 18 years as mayor. As a young boy growing up in Prospect Hill, I'd be on that bus to reach me the old the old node right there to try to get the Fenway most of the times with other kids in the neighborhood. That's when you could afford a ball game as a young kid. There's a lot of history. They started talking about the Green Line in the late 80s. And in 1991, the state imp implementation plan, the SIP, was executed as mitigation for the big dig. There was a lot of conversations and thoughts, and what about the Green Line? And it went nowhere. There were even plans that were going to go bury on the, you know, burrow on the Prospect Hill and get out to Medford. It was in 2004. It was in 2004, activists, advocates, people from all walks of life came together throughout those weeks and months. It was my first year as mayor. I remember one event, because Mike, you were there. The Red Sox were playing Game 4, sweeping their first World Series since 1918. And we were at... Well, everybody was at the bars and wherever watched the game, more than 500 people filled the Somerville High School Centennial Auditorium. Demanding, you will build the Green Line. You'll owe us. You'll owe us. Now, we went through a lot of history then, changes. We had promises. Doug Foy, who I saw earlier, we had a ceremony when he was under the Romney administration with Ian Tate, a Somerville resident, when they were in Commonwealth Development. We announced that finally the Green Line was in the state transportation plans. And that was one of the many groundbreakings and celebrations, Mike. I wore this tie, tie a few times. So <laughs> then Deval Patrick came to office, President Obama. Um, I seen Jeff Mullen, you know, Rich Davies, Tim Aloisi, so many people. We worked together. We, we finally got to the point where we launched the project. We had a celebration with then FDA Secretary Fox at Summerall High School, and we signed a notice to proceed, as Mike said, at the last days of the Deval Patrick administration. We're on our way, right? Well then, you know, unfortunately as a mayor, like the officials, we attend a lot of services, wakes. I went more, to more wakes for the Green Line than anything else in my life in the last 18 years. To so hear the project was severely over budget, and we weren't going to make it, and it was in doubt. It was another blow to the community. A blow to the community. It's true. It's, it's anything that gets some of them motivated is to tell them something's not going to happen or can't happen. Truly, when they stood up, committed to me and we're going to get this through. And it brings me to the Baker Polito administration. I want to talk about leadership. Governor Baker and Karen Polito from that moment never wavered. They believed in this project. Governor Baker called me and said, I want to do this project, but I think we can do this and not spend an extra billion dollars. I wholeheartedly agreed. Got Lieutenant Governor Polito committed, we're going to work together. Secretary Pollock and their team, the NPO, David Moeller and everyone, we gathered together. Tom Bent, our representative of the NPO, our state delegation, our city council and boards of aldermen, residents, we got together and said, we're going to make some choices. We're going to make some unpopular ones. We're going to redesign these stations, we're going to bring this into, into budget, and we got to get this done. Shout out to the Fiscal Management Control Board. Your former Chair Joe Yellow, I have to be honest, I won't admit or deny, we may have had some 30 back channel conversations over the years. <laughs> I get this project through. And we worked together, and I remember culminating in one meeting at then Secretary Pollock's office with former city manager Rich Rossi, working together with Mr. Siddiqui and the Cambridge City Council and Lou Di Pasquale, and we executed an MOA. And some of them in Cambridge did something unprecedented. We put up 50 million, Cambridge put up 25. Because it was important. For a project that was legally required, but it was just a partnership. And we worked together with our colleagues at the FTA, at the federal level, to get this project going. And it's going, it's great. So today's emotional. Today's emotional, but the leadership, I once again want to ring out Governor Baker. What they did is unheralded. The establishment of the Fiscal Management Control Board, 
Investing in the capacity in the team to manage big projects is important to get it done. And they got it done. Forever grateful, Governor, because this project wouldn't happen unless you guys got it over the top. You and the Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. The entire mascot team, including Secretary Tesla, Steve Partek, and I do want to say the project management team, the whole GLX team, those dark days of COVID, I look out my window and, and look down at what was going on in Gilman Square and around the corridor, and your work and hard work and dedication inspired me. This isn't an easy project. This is not just tracks, there's several bridges, power sources. All in all, good for you, the people of our communities, for fighting hard and never giving up. Congratulations to all. Now, let's bring this to Route 16. It has to happen. Mayor Siddiqui, this needs to go to Porter Square and link up with the red and commuter rail. It's not that complicated if we're just, if we're just dedicated to it. I'm going on another train ride. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. It's, we, uh, we brought our next speaker on to be the closer for this project. He is also going to be the closer for this event. He has led this project back from the brink. He has got this done. He has finished the Union Square branch. You're all invited back later this year when we do the Medford branch. So it's my pleasure to introduce GLX Project Manager John Dalton. Bear with me. Big day. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody, for being here today and continuing to show your support and interest in this great project. <clears throat> I will be brief, I promise. There's a few people, though, I do want to acknowledge. Um, first off is my wife, Hasmeen. Hasmeen has been my sounding board, um, my angel on my shoulder, my therapist sometimes when needed. Um, and without her, I wouldn't be standing here today with, with you. So, Hasmeen, I love you and thank you. <laughs> Second, to the MBTA and MassDOT leadership. Um, to be in my position and have a board like I've had the pleasure of working for, I couldn't ask for any more. But more specifically, I want to sh give a shout out to my boss, Steve Poftak. Steve's leadership, his counsel, his support has made this project what it is today. So Steve, thank you. I also want to recognize my counterpart on the GLX Constructors team, Steve Varnell. Stephen. Stephen and I have a daily phone call at 6.30 every morning. And the way that conversation goes is this. Stephen, what can I do for you today to make this project successful? I give him an answer. He says, John, what can I do for you today to make this project successful? I give him an answer. We collaborate. We don't see eye to eye every day, but one place we do see eye to eye is that we want to get this job done safely, quickly, and open to the public as quickly as possible. So Stephen, thank you for your partnership. And, and lastly, like others have done, I, I, I have to say this, and it's, it's the most appropriate. The project team that has gotten this job done, both the MBTA staff and the GLS Constructor staff, who work collaboratively every day. You see them all here, easy to spot. Say thank you to them before we leave today, please. But especially... But especially the men and women the men and women on those work crews who are out on the front lines every day. And by the way, we're out there every day and night in the darkest days of the, of, the, of the pandemic. When we were all scared and all at home, they were there every day. And 
and without question, we would not be here today without what they did. Absolutely not. So to those people, to my colleagues in this project, enjoy this moment. Be proud. Soak it in. And know that tomorrow, we come back to finish. Maybe this afternoon come back to finish. We're not done yet. So with that, I'll say, on to Medford. Thank you very much. As John said, we're not, we're not finished. For the folks up on this stage, literally we're not finished. We're going to have to do pictures and ribbon cutting, so please stay. For those, everyone else, again, as John said, we'll be back later this year to open the Medford branch, but now we actually are finished. So thank you all for coming. Service opened up at 4.50 a.m. It's running now. Go upstairs and catch a train.